Hello, we're here with Vivian Song Maritz, who is running for Seattle School Board, position number four. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Yes. Um, nice to meet everybody here. Um, yeah, as Nicole said, I am Vivian Song Maritz, and I am running for Seattle School Board, position in number four. And why am I running? Um, I believe that public schools are the bedrock of our community. Um, a thriving and just society owes equal opportunity to all, and that cannot be achieved without quality, inclusive education. I know this firsthand as a child immigrant who came to the United States with literally nothing, just $500 in their pockets. From my beginnings as an English as a second language learner, or what is now known as a dual language learner, whose hearing disability was identified by a teacher, I received quality public education and um, the first woman in my family to graduate from college. Public education transformed my family and my life trajectory. I am a private sector professional with over 15 years of experience in finance and operations and have a master's in business administration from Harvard Business School. For more than 25 years, I've had deep civic engagement with volunteer work and youth programs, particularly ones in immigrant communities. I proudly identify as Asian American and disabled. Of utmost importance to me, I am a mother of four children, current and future Seattle Public School students. And in my capacity serving on the superintendent's parent advisory council and as PTSA president, I've spent many hours advocating in partnership with other parents and stakeholders in local and state forums. And as I attended more and more school board meetings, I realized that there was an opportunity for me to better serve our community. I bring a diverse background, a true commitment to public schools, and a genuine desire to work collaboratively for greater opportunity and outcomes. Among my priorities as director are making real progress on real inclusion, establishing mental health as an essential service of schools, supporting working families with transportation, and committing to good governance and decision making through authentic community engagement and leveraging my finance and operational skills. I seek to help our community recover from the pandemic, especially our students where there's some educational justice and become stronger than ever. So thank you so much for your consideration of my candidacy. Thank you so much. Uh, so now we'll move into uh, the prepared questions and I will put them in the chat as we move along. I apologize in advance, they're a little long. Um, I just put the first one in there and I'm gonna have somebody also read along with it. And um, let me go to the queue here. I think we're next on Laura. If you would take question one, we'll follow by Layla, Summer, then Mackenzie. Policies will you seek to ensure that all students, regardless of gender, race, class, disability, or ethnicity, receive an education to reach their fullest potential? What would you do to advance anti-racist and indig indigenous curriculum and promote racial equity in Seattle public schools? Okay. Um, First of all, I just, I'll just explain that my children go to John Stanford International School. It's a dual language immersion school, an option school. And um, one of the things that drew me to that school is uh, the diversity of the teaching staff. I myself did not have a teacher of color until I was a sophomore in college. And it was a Asian woman from, who was an East Study, Asian studies professor. So one of the policies that I hope to implement is we need to build that bench. We need to recruit and retain teachers of color and we need to pay close attention to how far we are achieving our goals. Um, also at John Stanford International Schools and I really admire the dedication of our staff. They um, adopted the ethnic studies curriculum which was a 2017 board policy that, in my opinion, hasn't been executed um, and it's very disappointing, but our teachers have adopted it. And in addition, even in a pandemic year, they have committed to the Black Lives Matter year of purpose to supplement this learning. And as a parent, I can tell you that I have seen real progress when we bring that kind of curriculum into our classrooms and really promotes racial equity within school buildings. And I think it's very important that we make 
serious efforts to expand this district wide. Great, thank you so much. And uh, question number two, Layla. <clears throat> What would you do to advocate for ample and equitable funding for K-12 education, including special education, school nurses, counselors, mental health professionals, and paraeducators? Para Students in special education continue to not receive the education that they are morally and legally entitled to. How would you ensure that students, educators, and schools are supported both with policy and funding? So one of my top priorities as director is to make mental health support essential. I want it in the, I want to conceive of it as um, how we have nutritional services for our students that, that uplift for impoverished students um, when we brought free and reduced lunch into our schools. In my mind, mental health services should be at that same level of commitment like essential service. I have already for the last two years been advocating at state and local levels for greater funding for school counselors, school social workers, school nurses. I do not think it's right that our building leaders um, need to choose between these essential services and whether or not we will have important um, uh, 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 important things like a librarian, for example, or a music teacher. Those should also be part of a basic education um, for our students. So I will be use my position to continue to advocate at state and local levels. Um, and with regard to special education, um, you know, I'll just note that as I mentioned before, I um, ha have hearing loss. I am also a parent of a student that has hearing loss and it's taken by the fact that she also has epilepsy. And her teachers have been incredible um, in accommodating her needs. Um, and they definitely operate from this perspective that special education students are general education students first. So I, um, but I, the reason that she is getting the experience that she is getting is because I am able to advocate for her. And unfortunately, I don't think this level of parent advocacy is possible on a consistent basis, nor isn't it reasonable. We really need to advocate specifically for more funding for our special education students. And I will also note that a high percentage of our special education students happen to be students of color. And, um, and we also know that unfortunately there is a connection between special education students and the school to prison pipeline. There are many people who are in presence who um, are disabled. And if we are serious about addressing inequity and racism, we will invest in special education. And I will use my position to advocate. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, question number three, I believe this is Summer. You're still on mute, Summer. Just realized that, thank you. For several years, directors and leaders have said that SPS's enrollment projections were sig significantly flawed and coming off of a year of online school now, the concerns regarding enrollment projections and budget loom large. What would you do to ensure the district accurately projects enrollment and school budgets for the 2021-2022 year and in the future? I um, have been paying close attention to this. Um, I mentioned earlier that I have a professional background in finance and operations. So I tend to be quite nerdy about enrollment numbers and the implication on our budget. And um, I know a lot that our kindergarten in particular was under enrolled during this pandemic year. And because of its direct connection to the number of enrolled students and how much funding we get from the state, it makes our budget very complicated to plan for the next year. So I will make it a priority that we revisit our enrollment modeling. We need to be taking regular data that we can get from the state on our population projections um, and incorporate into our model. There are other sources of information that we can use to corroborate what we're, demographic trends that we're seeing. Um, for example, um, birth data, um, we could partner with uh, daycares and preschools in um, local neighborhoods to try to understand, um, you know, 
what can we expect for an uh, incoming kindergarten class? And, um, you know, another source of information is to look at the option school requests. We, those are submitted in January and February and can be a leading indicator to what overall enrollment will look like. Um, I know, for example, in this pandemic year, it's 33% um, down. So um, unfortunately, th um, that is not, does not bode well for our district. And coupled to that, I would be interested in encouraging our district to be more proactive in getting students to enroll and to enroll early so we have the information to present to the state in terms of our funding needs. Great, thank you. And question four, um, Mackenzie. Thank you. Uh, do you support SPS continuing option schools such as language immersion, uh, STEM, STEAM, international uh, baccalaureate, I hope I said it correctly, uh, project-based and other opportunities at specific schools? And do you support continued transportation for K through eight students to such option schools to offer familiar, I'm sorry, to offer families equitable public school choices? This is an issue that I am pretty close to as a parent of students at an option school. Um, first, I will um, just acknowledge that I do think that the current enrollment process is not equitable. And as a reflection, when we look at the student population at some option schools, um, uh, it, it's not reflective of the population in the overall neighborhood. And so, but I am extremely in favor of these programs and I have several reasons for that. Um, first of all, our educators and even more so in this pandemic year, it's become apparent to me, are very innovative and have amazing ideas and are doing incredible work at these option schools. And we should be encouraging them to develop new curriculum. And um, these are very popular programs. Instead of closing them, we should be expanding them. Let's look at neighborhoods that do not have option schools. Let's look at how we can get more people to enter the lottery. Are there ways that we can um, redesign the lottery process to make them equitable? Should we be moving some option schools to different neighborhoods to rebalance? Um, you know, I have talked to a lot of K through eight parents and in those middle school years, they specifically chose their schools because they felt that their child would benefit from a different model from those middle school years. And, and it just, we, our children are not cookie cutter. We need to respect the fact that there are a diversity of learning styles and our programming should be reflective of that. And I, I understand that um, the current process is inequitable, but there's ways that we can easily improve them without closing them. And with regard with the transportation, um, I actually worked with a group of parents to write a white paper on the option school transportation. So we took uh, city demographic data and looking at that data, the option school transportation, first of all, is a small percentage of the overall transportation budget. Um, I think there's a misunderstanding of who gets to ride the bus. Like for example, I don't live in close enough proximity to my option school. So my kids actually do not qualify. We're not busing kids from all over the city to go to these option schools. It's rather think of it as a donut um, and kind of similar to how busing works for neighborhood schools. But also by cutting option school transportation, it would be impacting the option schools that do have a high percentage of students for this from educational justice. Because in those neighborhoods, there tends to be greater distances where those students are living to their option school. And so it's disproportionately impacting them. Um, you know, transportation is very much needed for working families. And actually that will be one of my top priorities as a board director, making sure that we are supporting working families by providing consistent and high quality transportation. So now we'll move, thank you so much. And now we're moving into uh, the uh, follow-up question and answers from the board. And I will try to type them into the box as they're being asked. Um, does anybody have one to get started with? If so, please raise your hand. Go ahead, Summer. 
Hi, Vivian. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just taking a bite. So can you, <laughs> please, <laughs> can you tell us what uh, committees would you want to be on and what would you want your focus to be if you were uh, to get this elect, uh, if you were to win this election and be a school board director? I would very much like to be on the budget committee. I think I have um, the financial and operational skill set to uh, evaluate um, important budget decisions. Um, and, you know, that is one of the primary responsibilities of the board. Um, and knowing that we have limited funds and we need to make really hard choices, I want us to be thoughtful. I want us to think about. Um, what is our kind of return on investment? So when we spend a dollar in this area, what kind of um, return do we expect? Um, kind of thinking about it in those terms. Um, and I think there's opportunities for improved efficiency. I know, for example, in transportation, um, the, the way that transportation is currently decided is based on students who are eligible for busing versus like the routes versus students who are actually taking the buses. So, you know, there would be easy cost efficient ways to um, ask who wants to take a bus and plan the routes around that. Now that's getting into the weeds. I don't want to tell the transportation department how to do their job, but as a board, when I'm looking at the budget, these are the kinds of questions I would be asking. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Um, Summer, go ahead. I have another one if uh, nobody else, I don't want to uh, impede anyone else. Um, but I have, you know, long since thought that a lot of the ways, sorry, my puppy, every time I talk, he wants to get up. Um, I have long since thought that one of the ways we could deal with transportation, especially for older students um, who don't necessarily get the yellow bus is to uh, work with, have Seattle Public Schools work with Seattle Council. And I have once testified as to transportation and busing for, at Seattle Council. Um, to really have the to have Seattle focus more on neighborhood to neighborhood transportation for metro buses and a link and other um, public transit ways, because right now we have such a history of redlining in Seattle, and yet high schoolers who don't get the yellow bus can there's um, supposedly 10% of open seats at each high school. But um, without public transit that would get um, students from a neighborhood to a farther high school, we really deal with still so much forced segregation. And I know a lot of parents would like all the schools to be much more um, equitably open to each student, but without some help with public transit from Seattle, public, uh, from Seattle City Council, I don't see how that gets better uh, with just Seattle Public Schools alone. Is that something that you would want to work on or talk to the Seattle City Council about? A hundred percent. So as I was doing the working on the white paper and trying to trying to understand the transportation challenges in our district, um, that was one of the strategies that I had that we really needed to reach out and partner with our city. I'm super excited. We've got leadership that has coming from King County Metro, who they know something about um, transportation. But you know, I, I wanna present this to the city council. As you said, th this is an issue of addressing the inequities from redlining, um, but there's other issues at play like um, air quality. Like if we can really, you know, improve transportation in our city. We will improve the air quality of our city. We will improve the traffic flow in our neighborhoods. I, I think this is a fantastic opportunity uh, to partner with our city. And, and just in general, I think that, um, I don't feel at this moment that our school district, our school board and our school leaders are really partnering with the city. We have so many shared issues and it will be one of my priorities to foster a relationship with our um, city council and help them really understand that our schools, having high functioning, high quality schools is essential to the Seattle thriving. So um, I, I, I am very passionate about that summer. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, I have one more question, um, and it's mostly just about like the school board meetings. Um, how would you contribute to a successful school board meeting? Um, it's funny because you guys are in my bedroom. You can 
kind of see <laughs> what I have by my bedside. Um, it's a framed picture of, um, it's a print and it's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And it's, uh, it says, fight for the things that you care about and do it in a way that will lead others to join you. And anybody who has ever worked with me will say, this is so true to who I am. I am all about calling in, not calling out. I'm about working on problems together. Um, and, you know, sometimes things are contentious because um, we have really limited resources and we care really passionately about um, inclusive, welcoming, equity. We have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of urgency. Um, but I firmly believe that um, the way we work together in the school board it's contagious. So if we work together as well as a school board, we are going to really support our superintendent. When our superintendent is successful, his chiefs are successful. When the chiefs are successful, the building leaders are successful. When the building leaders are successful, our teachers are successful. And when the teachers are successful, of course, our kids are successful. I mean, this is the whole reason why I am so excited um, to be part of this board. Um, you know, I, I, I really feel that I can lend um, that kind of style to um, our district. Great. Thank you so much. And on that note, we are running out of time. So if oh. you would like to go ahead okay. and give a one minute wrap up, that'd be great. Okay. Okay. Um, of course, thank all of you for your time and considering my candidacy. Um, I would be really honored to receive your endorsement. And I have... Um, I've never run for office. And um, it was kind of fun to work on this questionnaire and be very thoughtful about um, what are the things that I'm passionate about and I want to accomplish. And this is a very intentional process. And so um, thank you for allowing me to participate in it. Um, and, you know, having been an advocate in Seattle Public Schools and again, going through this candidacy process, I wanna thank our current school board directors and all the candidates who are running in district four, five, and seven for raising their hand because this is not easy. Um, here are the things that I think I will bring to the table. One, um, as a person of color, someone who is disabled, a parent of a disabled student, someone with connections to the immigrant community and has experiences of English language or dual language learners, I, I'm not going to speak for others, but I will use this as a basis and a drive for always being curious and wanting to know more. I, number two, I will bring my financial and operational skills to all the important tasks of recruiting and hiring a superintendent, approving a budget, especially knowing when we need to make really hard choices with our expected finance deficits. And then finally, again, I just wanna reiterate my working and leadership step. Fight for the things you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. And anyone who is engaged with me or worked with me will just corroborate that. So, um, and I care so passionately um, for children. I mean, I have four of my own. Can you tell that I love kids? <laughs> um, so thank you so much for your time and your consideration. Thank you so much.